So can everyone hear me? Good, in the back? All right, good, good. Uh, so my name is Rob. He has uh, given me a very good introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking today on Plague Scanner. And uh, this is an open source project that has been in the works probably for about two and a half years. Um, it has uh, coagulated into something real in the past six months. And I've been uh, going to a number of uh, other conferences and giving talks on it. Um, <clears throat> and this is the latest iteration of it. So who am I? Uh, I'm a senior threat intelligence researcher for Threat Connect. Uh, we're in Arlington, Virginia. My contact information is at the bottom. That's my Twitter handle and email address. Um, I can also give you a card later uh, after the talk so we can uh, contact each other later. Um, so let's just go into the problem here. So you have an unknown or malicious binary, and you want to scan it with as many AV engines as possible. So there are a couple of, there are a couple of uh, ways that you can do this, a couple of uh, options available to you. So the first option available is to upload the binary to a multiple AV scanner site online. And we all know which ones these are. There are a few of them. Uh, there, there's a growing number of them. People will actually put up a, uh, a version of Cuckoo Sandbox and put it online and then just collect binaries from it. It's a very good technique for gathering binaries. And let me repeat that. It's a very good technique for gathering binaries. So they are gathering the binaries that you upload so let's say you're, you're, you've got a weaponized PDF, and we'll, we'll see some of that in a moment. Uh, you don't necessarily want to upload that to any of these online sites because they are gathering the binaries. And you don't know who, they have, who they're sharing those binaries with, who has access to that data. Um, you have to trust them, and I don't trust anybody. So <clears throat> the second solution is to buy your own AV scanner engine system. And these are very, 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 very expensive. And when I say very expensive, I mean very, very, very expensive. Um, on the order of $80,000 a year type expensive. So that's not really an option for small guys. Uh, that's an option for a giant enterprise, but a giant enterprise might have other, you know, other resources available. So uh, that's not an option that's, that's uh, viable for me. So solution number three is to create an open source multiple AV scanner framework and share it with the world, a la some of my favorite uh, uh, projects out there. <clears throat> so uh, let me give you a few real world use cases for this. So I, I originally had spoken with uh, a number of people at, uh, at DEF CON about this, and that's where the, the whole idea came from, and I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, my my you know, my use case is blue team, so targeted weaponized PDFs and other types of documents with corporate data embedded in there as bait. Uh, those are the types of things that this is, is uh, meant for. However, when I was speaking at Shmukhan this year, uh, I spoke with a, a, a group of people who uh, work on pen testing, and they develop their own malware. And they want something like this because they don't want to share their targeted uh, you know, custom malware uh, that they're going to use on a red team engagement with you know, the, 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 the general public of the variety of online sites. So that's a different use case that I hadn't really thought about, but it's a valid use case for this. <clears throat> Obviously, I don't want to have adversaries looking at this and, and using it, but it's open source if they want to go pay for all of it and, and put it together, you know. Uh, it's, it's out there. So <clears throat> let me give you a quick demo of what I'm talking about here and what sort of things you would use this for. So this. So I recorded the demo just to uh, appease the demo gods. So as you, you might recognize, this is a uh, reverse engineering malware workstation uh, environment. Uh, I have a number of tools. Uh, go ahead and take a screenshot if you don't know all those tools. Uh, you know, you might see some that you don't know. You might see some that you do know. So this is, uh, I've got Process Hacker open on the right. Um, some people use a di different tools. They're all essentially the same thing as Task Manager, but on steroids. So <clears throat> let's watch what happens. So you can see in uh, Process Hacker, everything looks uh, nice and clean. Let me, ooh, hold on. Pause this and move the move that down so you can see Process Hacker fully. 
Okay, so this is the PDF attachment that, to an email, and boom, huh, current literature? That's very interesting. That's from 1891. Uh, and what makes this really interesting is this PDF is six pages long. That's actually very rare for malware to weaponize something that's more than just one page. Usually they just have one page to kind of, you know, bait you into uh, clicking and, or opening or, or remaining there. So this is actually a six-page document. And this, this came in on, uh, on a sensor that I have, uh, and it, it actually has access to one of those uh, online AV scanner engines. And let me pause this for a second so we can... Uh, just go over that for a second. So I collected this from an AV, on one of those online AV scanner engines where someone else had uploaded it, right? So this doesn't exactly look too scary. However, this piqued my interest and I thought, you know, this is a six page document. This is an unusual way of weaponizing something. So I started looking into it. Uh, I reverse engineered this and the, uh, I'll, I'll actually uh, hit play again. So as you can see down here, there is an extra DLL host and also the, the I will highlight it in a second. Come on. There we go. So that's the extra DLL host and then uh, it is also running still a copy of, uh, of the reader, which is the built-in 8.1 uh, PDF reader for Microsoft. So both of those are, uh, the DLL host is running, that's actually the malware, and then, <clears throat> sorry, and the, uh, the reader is still running, it didn't shut down properly, even though I clicked shut down and, and close. So uh, it, it definitely affected the, the, uh, the, the reader process. Also, I'm gonna highlight, this is one of the reasons why I like Process Hacker, because you can go into a running process and run strings on its memory, so that's actually a very cool feature. So let me pause this and let's go back to the presentation. So if that does, so that's actually a little bit worrying uh, where what's going on there. So I went and took an SSD uh, uh, hash, and if anyone's familiar with SSD, it's a uh, it's called a piecewise hash or a fuzzy hash, and what it does is it takes the entire binary file and it essentially chops it up into pieces and then takes uh, sub-hashes of the different parts of it. And what this is good for is instead of having like a SHA-1 or an MD5 hash, you can then take this hash and then see how similar the file that you have is to a group of other files that have had an SSD hash done to them. So in mathematical terms, the two hashes kind of make a three-dimensional distance between the two uh, files. But uh, essentially, you are, you are looking for other files that are similar to this file. So uh, fortunately, the same uh, online scanner engine that I found this file has a way to search via SSD. So I took the SSD of this file and looked for other files that are similar to it. So this is, what's, this is where things get very scary. This, is, this happened last week, and this is all very new stuff. So on, uh, I, I looked at some of the scanner results for this, and it turns out that this piece of malware is called Ursniff. Uh, you might be familiar with it if you do malware analysis, maybe not. Uh, my focus is crimeware, and that's one of the, that's one of the types of crimeware out there. Uh, and this is a new... Uh, new variant, there was a, a Trend Micro paper about it back in January, uh, and what it does is after, it, after you are infected, it looks in your hard drive and weaponizes all of the PDFs that you have on your hard drive and then just lets them sit there, right? So then when you go to get your invoice that you want to send to your client, you just drag the invoice to your email and send it off, and you've unwittingly sent them a copy of Ursniff which is a weaponized copy of your, you know, your PDF, which is you know, tailored to them almost uh, perfectly because the malware author doesn't even have to think about what to tailor to, uh, to the target. So let me show you. I, this is gonna look like a Freedom of Information Act uh, request because I've, I, have, uh, I have redacted a lot of these, but this, this is where things get very scary because I pulled all of these copies off of the, uh, the online malware scanner. 
So <clears throat> this is a certificate of analysis for some sort of chemical. Uh, no idea what it is. Um, <clears throat> and then this is the this is a check register from a company. Uh, I've redacted the name of the real estate agent. Uh, and this is a you know a, a invoice for uh, parts for a car at a car service center. So these are the sorts of things that you save on your hard drive, right, and, and keep for later. Uh, these are the sort of things that this piece of malware is weaponizing. Uh, this is a packing list for something. Uh, oh, and also, by the way, this is this this one. Um, one of the things that I did with this uh, set of documents uh, was sort of a, a, a look into the idea of who the victims are, and I could tell by the collection of documents who the kind of the initial infection uh, uh, points were. Because any business document essentially has two companies involved with it, you know, a sender and a receiver. And so by taking all of these and making a, a, you know, a spreadsheet of the senders and receivers, I can see that, okay, this person uh, has a, this, this uh, company is co in common with all of these different documents, so they must have been the initial uh, vector. And then this company and this company. And so the company here is actually a uh, manufacturer of, I, you know, I'm not familiar with the, with the type of stuff they make. I have some of their glossies, which were weaponized. Uh, but those, uh, the part, they make little metal, you know, machine parts and stuff like that. But I know who their clients are because this document is a packing list that they sent for, uh, to a major car manufacturer. So a uh, major car manufacturer is one of their clients. And then this is, a, um, this is the uh, real estate agent. So these are uh, copies of their checks that were weaponized. Um, also very, very scary. Uh, and then this is just an email talking about, uh, I believe this is talking about making a donation to uh, the Humane Society. Uh, and then here is, is that the check to the Humane Society? No, that's a check for a real estate agent. There's actually, oh, I, sorry, the, I didn't include the check, but there's actually the check to the Humane Society that they'd weaponized. So one of the very frightening parts about this is so I know now that there are three companies uh, from these documents. There's a real estate agent. Uh, there's a manufacturer of machine parts. Um, there is a uh, shale oil fracking company doing like uh, uh, shale oil rigs in Pennsylvania. And then there's a, uh, a supplier for EMT and fire you know, equipment in uh, Montana. So those are the ones that I, tar I figured out were the targets of the, of the attack. So these are the types of documents that you don't want to upload to an online AV scanner, right? <laughs> I think it should be obvious that you don't want to upload these. And one thing that's interesting with these AV scanners is they track who it is that's uploading it. So they see the IP address that's uploading it. Um, if you have an account with them, then obviously it's, it's uh, connected to that. So, you know, each one of these came in from the web interface. So these were, you know, people at one of these companies or a company that was doing business with them and was sent one of these. And they probably just got an email with an attachment that was strange uh, and then submitted it to the online AV scanner. And then I got a copy of all of them. So, and myself and lots of other people, including AV, uh, AV companies and security companies in other countries, you have no idea where the stuff is going. So, bad idea. <clears throat> so, the uh, onwards to the next uh, the next uh, uh, use case. So the next use case I have is for red teams. And how many in here are pen testers? Two, three, four. Okay. So do you guys use tailored malware in any of your engagements? Yes. We got a yes over here. Would you want to share that piece of malware with anyone that's not? Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Very good answer. So, uh, and I just wanted to highlight because when I uh, when I've given a talk at uh, when I gave the talk at Shmukan, I was actually followed by one of the guys that is in Veil Framework, uh, one of the authors of Veil Framework. So this is a very great piece of software for uh, for pen testing, 
And what it does is you take your piece of malware and you can use Veil Framework to obfuscate it in ways so that it avoids being detected by AV scanners. So the Veil Framework folks were saying, you know, we've thought about making something like Plague Scanner for a while, but now you're making it so great. <laughs> Um, but they're really great guys, and that's actually a great, uh, great project. Uh, Backdoor Factory is another one uh, where you are creating backdoored binaries that are real binaries from a system. So you can take, uh, I saw the, their, their demo at uh, DerbyCon, which was fascinating. He put a backdoor in Safari, the actual Safari uh, executable on, the, on a laptop, and so it you know called back to his uh, his uh, C2, so uh, backdoor factory is another one where if you're making a, a backdoor binary, you want to make sure that it's not going to be shared out, and you can get uh, you you're not sharing how you backdoored it. Um, side note, backdoor factory is has been in the news, uh, and it might not have been in the news directly, but it was uh, a, a instance of backdoor factory was uh, reported. I don't know if any, has anyone heard of Onion Duke? Onion Duke, it's a piece of malware, Onion Duke. So Onion Duke, you probably heard of Onion Duke, but you didn't know it by the name Onion Duke. So about six months ago, there was a Tor exit node discovered that was backdooring all of the binaries that are going up and down through it, right? Did you hear about that? Okay, so that was actually someone in Russia that had downloaded a copy of Backdoor Factory and installed it and combined it with a Tor exit node and created a, uh, you know, a fun, malware uh, transmission uh, uh, system. So that was, that, that's how, you, that, that's one use case of, of that. But, so this is how I formulated the plan for Plague Scanner. Uh, I don't know if you uh, recognize this bar, but it's shutters at uh, the Rio. So this is where, this is where I was talking to a number of other uh, security heads and DEF CON uh, con goers about uh, what to do in these different, uh, what to do with this problem, and came up with the idea of Plague Scanner. Um, and I was actually curious at the time why this is sort of something that seems obvious to me to have an open source project to do this sort of thing. But I realized the reason why it probably didn't happen yet is most people who are open source uh, advocates and big open, big time open source people, they kind of get hives when they look at closed source software. They don't want to work with stuff like that, so they wouldn't want to write a layer of open source over lots of uh, commercial software. That's not necessarily the the thing that the the first thing that comes to mind when you are a uh, open source uh, guru. So uh, I'm. My background is security, I love open source, and so this, this seemed obvious, and so after about two years of mulling it over, uh, I finally put some parts together and started the project. So, let's go over the basic components of Plague Scanner. So, it's all written in Python 3. Uh, every component is Python 3. I try in everything that I do to not use Python 2 anymore, if, and, and only if there's a uh, import that I have to use an old library or, or a library that still uses Python 2, I will use Python 2, but Python 3. Uh, this uses the Yapsi plugin system. This is a plugin system that you might recognize from other malware analysis project uh, called Mastiff. They use Yapsi. Uh, Mastiff is a uh, static malware analysis framework. Uh, so I, th they had a good idea, so I took it. Um, and then 0MQ is similar to RabbitMQ, if, you, if you're familiar with that. It's just a little bit faster, a little bit easier to use, a little bit cleaner. Um, <clears throat> so I use 0MQ for message queuing, and that is how uh, you know, the, the, the malware sample and then the code to run the malware sample is, is transmitted between the core and then each one of the AV scanner uh, VMs. So I used QMU originally, and I, I added, uh, about a month ago, I added VirtualBox virtualization for this, so it supports both VirtualBox and QMU. Uh, the reason I like QMU is it has uh, kernel same page merging, which is uh, a type of memory deduplication. So if you have two or more VMs, and the VMs all have a set of memory pages, 
uh, VMX and VMY, if they're running the same operating system, have almost the same set of memory pages. So why take up that much space in the host operating system? So kernel same page memory, uh, kernel same page merging, uh, works at the host level. And so if you have one identical uh, uh, page of memory, it's actually shared among all of the VMs that have that same page. So. Uh, VirtualBox has a similar technology. I don't remember it off the top of my head, but it's in a further slide. Um, unfortunately, the re well, the reason why I used QMU is that VirtualBox uh, under Mac OS, for some reason, VirtualBox's version of KSM does not work. So they don't have a supported, uh, they don't have that technology supported under uh, Mac OS. So if you run VirtualBox under Mac OS, all of your VMs have an entire, you know, you have this ever-growing uh, repetitive list of, uh, of memory pages. Uh, I use the Pillow Python image library, and this is for taking screenshots of uh, pop-up windows in the VMs. Uh, and then I use Tesseract OCR, and we'll go into why, uh, why this is necessary a little bit later. The report output is JSON. Uh, I don't like XML. XML is very last year. <laughs> uh, so the output is JSON. And then the reports can optionally be stored in Elasticsearch. And then you can do nice graph stuff and look at historical uh, AV engine results. So uh, the whole concept is that you bring the scanners. So you have it's, it's up to you to buy the licenses and get them installed correctly and follow the directions and read the manual of the manufacturer of those. Uh, that is not my problem. Uh, but I bring the plugins for each one of the scanners, so I make sure that it's instrumented properly. I make sure that there's each one of these, essentially the, the, the core of this is each one of these is a regex or a set of regexes that takes the output from uh, said AV scanner, pulls out the data that we need, and then sends all of that to a central core and then creates a, a master JSON file for that. So. I have identified uh, four, four general types of scanner engines out there. So the first one is open source. Uh, I believe, unless anyone knows of any further ones, I believe there's only one member of this uh, category that would be Clam AV. And then uh, the second is a Linux, has, has a Linux version available. So many commercial types of malware, AV, malware and AV scanners have a Linux version available. Uh, and if there's a Linux version available, that means there's a command line, and if there's a command line, it means it's easy for me to run it and get a regex and pull out all the data that I need. So uh, Linux, and I also, I mean, there are some companies that provide a free BSD version and other BSDs and other Unixes and stuff like that, but I'm focused on uh, Linux, just, you know, make it easy, make one, one that, that uh, and there isn't one, there is, there are no AV engines that make scanners for uh, a different Unix that don't make one for Linux. So I've, I've uh, focused on Linux. Uh, the third type is a Windows-only scanner. There's a lot of those out there. There's only, a ver there's only a version of it in Windows. And the good ones are number three. Those are the ones that have a command line interface available. Again, I, you know, I would prefer not using Windows, but where I have to use Windows, if I have a command line, then I get a, you know, a pile of text, and then I can use a regex on it, pull it all out, and do the same thing I did with the Linux version. Uh, the fourth type is where there's a GUI only. These are the, the, the real nasty ones and difficult to work with. So that brings me to uh, optical character recognition. So that fourth category of malware uh, or an AV scanner engine, is the one that requires OCR. So, uh, <clears throat> so with OCR, you take a screenshot in the VM of the pop-up that says, hi, you're infected with Ursniff, or hi, you're infected with whatever, and take a screenshot of that, uh, carve out the areas that, uh, that, that have the text that I want, and then run that through OCR, and then I get a pile of text that I run a regex on, pull that to the central core, and then add that into a, uh, a JSON document. This component of Plague Scanner is not fully working yet. This is uh, this is a tough. Uh, this is actually this is a a more difficult problem than you would think. Uh, but uh, it it is under construction. So 
This is the basic architectural diagram for uh, Plague Scanner. There is the, the submission, processing, and reporting component in, at the top center. Uh, I've called that the core, so that's uh, Plague Scanner core. There is an elastic search uh, option, so this is something also that you would set up yourself. Uh, you know, I'm not uh, going to concern myself uh, other than making sure that the code to write to Elasticsearch is correct, but where your Elasticsearch is and all that sort of stuff is up to you. So uh, you have to you know, create your cluster yourself. Uh, the message queue is that amorphous blob in the center, and that's 0MQ, uh, and that sends the messages between uh, the core and each one of the variety of VMs. And let me just show, uh, uh, touch on one point about the way that I have designed this. So each one of those VMs in the bottom has an agent which is listening for the, the zero MQ messages. And so each one of those agents is actually dumb. So they don't know anything about the type of VM that they're in. They have no idea about what type of AV scanner they're supposed to deal with. And the reason I did this was to make it easy on the end user for setting up the whole thing. The end user shouldn't have to have like a, a huge pile of agents that they have to figure out, okay, I've got a CLAM AV agent here, and then which one of these VMs is my CLAM AV, and I gotta put that in here and make sure that this all works. No, so the, the ultimate, uh, the, the end goal is each one of these is a dumb agent, and this is actually very unsafe. So you need to make sure that wherever you've put Plague Scanner is protected, you know, outside of Plague Scanner itself. So you need to make sure that this is on a separate uh, network because this, I, I make no effort whatsoever to, to check the code that those agents are running. So they get a message that contains the binary that they are going to scan and then they, they get a blob of Python script and then it just runs the Python script, and it, it puts the it, it puts the binary in a, in a set location, runs the runs the script, and then the script will go and look for the binary, run the right and run the right scanner engine, do the do the text processing, and then send a JSON message back to the core. So that's very dangerous because I do no checks whatsoever. So you if you're if you're running Plague Scanner out there uh, and have it open. To the internet, that would be very bad. If you have it like on your network, that also is fairly bad because someone might discover that you have this and then just start running arbitrary code on your on the VM. So make sure that you've protected this properly. Uh, but this also leads me to the next part. Uh, so I had a few lessons learned about the development of this. So when you're developing a distributed application such as this that uses a message queue, and you have uh, lots of little uh, VMs out there and then a central core. So that the, when you're doing development, that adds time to each you know, iteration of, uh, of a change in the code. So when you're sitting there and you're banging away at code and then you want to run and see if the thing that you did uh, works or bombs, when you hit run, it then has to send that message out to all of these things and this stuff has to come back. And you know I'm impatient, and I don't want to even wait that like you know few seconds or whatever. So, or actually, it's more more than more than like you know, 15, 20 seconds. So I don't want to wait that long. I want to just go bam, see if it runs, bam, see if it runs. So, I have implemented a sort of development version of the entire system, which works backwards from a smart agent and makes each one of the, so there's an alternate agent where each of those agents is actually smart and has the entire code in there so that I can work on that VM itself, not worry about the core, not worry about, worry about anything else, have a binary in the proper location, and then bam, just keep running the, uh, that particular uh, uh, agent. And then it has a REST API so that when I've got that one working, then I can kind of back up run the core, core goes out and asks all those REST APIs to, to do their stuff and then gets back the results. So then the, the second step of this is to write the Yapsi plugin. So once I've got a plugin, that, once I have an agent that works properly, carve out the proper piece of, uh, of code from it and drop that into a Yapsi plugin in the other version. So that's the development process. Um, it might, the, 
the, uh, the, the carving out and the making of the AFSI plugin might be a little bit more cumbersome and the setup of it is a little bit more cumbersome, but it just it makes it easy for someone that doesn't like to wait when they're doing development. So uh, I mentioned some of the cool features already and I wanted to highlight some of these, uh, some more of them. So kernel same page merging, uh, as I said, it allows uh, many VMs to share memory pages. Uh, this is the name of that technology in VirtualBox. It's called Page Fusion. Uh, and if you go into VirtualBox's uh, document set and just grep it for Page Fusion, you'll find the section on it and, and how to and, and how to set it up. I don't think there's a I don't think you have to set it up, uh, but uh, you can look in there and just double check. Um, I use Mac, so actually I don't don't necessarily use VirtualBox for much of this stuff. Um, <clears throat> So zero MQ is a very fast message queuing system. Uh, Elastic search is a good way to visualize and store and process and uh, have a NoSQL, basically a, a NoSQL-esque uh, database of your, of your uh, results. So one of the reasons why this is uh, important is let's say you get a binary that is new to you and it doesn't get detected by anything. So that's a little bit frightening, right? But as a researcher, you may want to know or uh, graph when different scanner engines began detecting it and see you know, who, who was better at detecting it, who might be following whom, because th you know, three or four of them might detect it all at the same time on a certain day, and, or maybe one of them got it, and then you know, a few days later, a lot of them got it. So you want to you know, be able to highlight who it is that, that uh, really got the, got the good good information on it. So uh, you want to be able to run the scan over and over and over and then take all of those scan results and plug them into Elasticsearch so that you can see the trending of uh, virus scanner results. Also, another thing that this is good for is let's say uh, I have a, a, a sample and I don't necessarily want to run it against a malware library uh, to find things that are related to it. Um, so, for example, I can take, there's three, there's three major uh, hashes that are good for this type of work. One is called import hash, uh, one is called PE hash, and one is SS deep. So each one of these is a way to find related malware. Uh, SS deep, I described earlier, it's a piecewise hash. Um, and then uh, import hash, takes a, a hash of the import table of the malware, and then it finds other malware that has a similar or matching import table. So, uh, or it set of, set of imports. Uh, import table, some of the stuff may not actually be in the import table, by the way. So uh, it takes a set of, uh, of the imports. And a PE hash takes a hash of uh, components of the PE uh, header. So the, uh, the whole, the whole idea here is to find other malware that's related to your piece of malware. So those searches might find things that are uh, known, or not, not necessarily known, but are uh, you know, uh, by a test similar to malware. However, there might be other copies of that malware that do not fit that model, that don't have a common SSD, don't have an import hash, don't have a PE hash, However, you have you know, a host of AV scanner companies that are out there working day and night on lots and lots and lots of malware. They may have uh, you know, decided that this piece of malware is related to your piece of malware, but the two of them don't have a common import hash, don't have a common PE hash, or SS deep. So there's no way for you to know if you have a malware library without you know, looking through your samples and, and already have seen that one to connect the two. But you could have had your entire malware library run through Plague Scanner, had all the results in Elasticsearch, and then done a free text search for the name uh, of, of a piece of malware, and then found all of the other. So if you, let's say you have run yours through here, and it says, hi, I'm Ursniff. So then you search for everything else that's Ursniff in there, and you'll get samples that may not have a common import hash may not have a common PE hash and may not have a common SSD. So you'll have other things to do research on and, and kind of figure out like who's doing what and who's related to who. 
So that's a very powerful feature of the software. Um, so there are a number of open issues in here. One of the major problems that I ran into is that, so I keep all of this uh, at a cloud, uh, you know, a, a, a cloud VM service. So one of the problems with that is even though they're like, you know, two cents, uh, two cents an hour to have your VM, if you have two cents an hour, but you've got lots and lots and lots of VMs running together, that adds up after a while. And the problem with combining them all into one VM or, or stacking them in any way, shape, or form in that way is that AV scanners don't play well with each other. They, they actually look for each other and they say, you know, if you install AV scanner X, it will say, dude, there's AV scanner Y right there. I'm not going to let you install me unless you remove that one. Or some of them go, hi, I found AV scanner B. I'm going to just remove it for you, and then it's gone. So that doesn't make it easy to install many uh, AV scanners together on the same machine. So uh, what I've come up with here is to use Docker. Um, you know, I, there are a few other competing uh, open source projects that do the same thing as Docker, but Docker is very, uh, you know, commonly found, well supported, um, and fairly easy to use. What Docker does is it creates containers inside of a, a, a Linux machine, and those containers, you can install software, in that, and the software that's in that container can't see the software that's in another container. So it's sort of a, uh, it's like a virtual, it's not a VM, but it's a virtual environment inside of a VM, uh, or inside of a, a bare metal machine. So you could, so you can install uh, any number of different systems in those uh, in those uh, Docker containers, and they can all live on one VM, and it would save money, uh, you know, for for cloud services. Um, and if uh, the next one OCR, so OCR is still that's a tough, that's a very tough problem. Um, it's difficult to get that correct, uh, and so I'm still working on that. Uh, daemonization, that's also something that I need to work on. Uh, the Plague Scanner core is still just a set of scripts where you run it and then it does its work and the, the, the information comes back. Uh, I would like to have it similar to, um, if you're familiar with Cuckoo Sandbox, anybody heard of Cuckoo? So Cuckoo actually sits there and runs and then you submit jobs to it via the, the uh, SQL uh, database that it keeps its job, store, job uh, list in. So I'd like to do something like that, like have a have like a, a list of jobs coming up, and then have a, a you know a, a always running process that the jobs are submitted to, and then have that do the processing uh, constantly. Um, another problem that uh, that these have so scanner updating. This is sort of like herding cats. Like each one of these AV scanner engines wants to update in a different way, wants to update at a different time. And so they're all just, you know, they're, they're doing kind of random things, right, to, to update themselves. Uh, I don't have a way to watch, monitor, or, uh, you know, uh, coordinate any of the updating. It just either doesn't happen and you have to do it manually, or uh, it does its own automated updating and does it whenever it wants to, or it breaks, or whatever. So what I want to do is have some uh, layer where it watches for updates or controls updates for each type of scanner engine. And that's also valuable because it would give me a, a date or a timestamp when the update happens and I can add that to the JSON document for each one of the scanner results. And that can be important because the, the scanner signatures that a scanner uses might be different at 4 p.m. than they were at 8 a.m. And you know that's important because at 4 p.m. it began detecting ERSNF, and at 8 a.m. it didn't detect it. So I want to know, like, I want to be able to see that in the data and be able to look at those sorts of changes. So that's important to have in there, but it doesn't do that yet. Um, that is also going to be a, a difficult problem because, as I said, it's like herding cats. They all want to go in different directions, and they, you know, they want some of them want to go outside, some of them want to go come back inside right after they go outside. Um, <clears throat> So uh, the next thing that, that's, uh, that, that is an open problem is resubmission automation. So I want to, and this, is, this depends on the daemonization step, uh, I want to be able to not burden someone with a scanner result of zero. So if there's a scanner result of zero, 
you could have a flag set for that job that says, if it has zero, uh, rescan on a schedule. Don't ask me, you know, don't make me come back and do anything. Just rescan on a schedule until it hits a scanner result. And when it hits a scanner result, maybe send me an email or an alert or a, a Nagios, uh, uh, you know, turn something yellow or whatever. Uh, and so say like, hey, uh, you've got a result. So I want to automate that so you don't have to really think about it. If you've got a lot of stuff coming in, you don't want to sit there and kind of uh, fiddle with all of it. You want to be able to automate your, th your, your processes. So have uh, resubmission automation. Uh, another feature, if you're familiar with, uh, again, Cuckoo Sandbox or Thug. Thug is a uh, um, low interaction honey client. It's for visiting a website and then when you visit the website, getting the malware from it. So it pretends to be uh, a variety of, uh, of uh, uh, browsers, and it also pretends to have the correct, uh, the correct Java version or Flash version or uh, reader version that is necessary to be infected, and so it collects the binary from, the, from that visit. So uh, these two things, uh, Cuckoo Sandbox is a thing for sandboxing malware and getting all of the indicators of compromise out of it and getting its behavioral uh, uh, and other, other components. Cuckoo has lots more in it than that. But both of them have the ability to use a protocol called HP Feeds. And I don't know if you're familiar with HP Feeds, but it's part of the HoneyNet project. And what it is, it's a... Uh, publish and subscribe protocol for sandboxes and, and collectors of malware data. So you can have instances of Thug and Cuckoo out there in the world, and then they can be producing uh, binaries and also the binary analysis data, right? And it combines all of this into a feed, and then the feed can be subscribed to by other researchers. And HP Feeds actually has a social platform. It's a social network based on malware called HP Friends. <laughs> uh, and HP Friends, you sign up for accounts, and you know instead of it being Facebook where you uh, you know you message each other about like uh, whatever you do and and share uh, photos and stuff like that, you share malware feeds with HP Feeds. So you have your friends in HP Friends, and then if you're a friend or you know if you're in a group. You get to you know you get to subscribe to all of the HP feeds that, that group publishes. So it's an interesting concept. Um, I would love to have uh, HP feeds uh, ability in Plague Scanner so that you could have a Plague Scanner instance out there, and then if you so choose, you could share all of the uh, binaries and the the, the AV results uh, with your with your HP friends out there. Uh, that is not in there yet. It's just a. a a uh, hope that I get to that eventually. Uh, so let's do a demo of the of Plague Scanner. So sorry about the resolution on this. Um, it's another recorded demo, and I apologize for the resolution. But Okay, so in the, on the right side, you see again, uh, that's Process Hacker. I love Process Hacker. This is just to show, uh, I, I'm using it here just to show that the thing is working uh, because this particular, this particular uh, VM that we're looking at right now is a Windows VM and it's running uh, Trend Micro Scanners, uh, Trend Micro's scanner, and Trend Micro Scanner is a little bit uh, wonky at some times and it, it can choke on some of the binaries, and so I'll have to go in here and actually hit, you know, a, a click a button. So that's actually one of the things that I want to work on uh, is have a button clicker. <laughs> you know, if it, if if a if a, a window pops up with a button, I just want to you know, click the button. Who cares what it says? I don't just click it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, like a user, exactly. I mean, it's basically uh, that. There, there's a uh, there's a button clicker in uh, in in uh, Cuckoo Sandbox, and it's actually called Human Dot <laughs> So, okay, so uh, we're gonna watch the session here. So. This is this is the uh, this is one of the scanner engines. It's uh, Trend Micro, um, and then. 
in a moment. We will go to, we'll take a look at core. Wish I had a little, an easier fast forward. Okay, so this is, this is the core. Let me scoot, oh, don't skip all the way ahead. Sorry about that. Trying to move this up here, right out of the way. Okay, so, all right, this is the core, and at this point we're running uh, samples through it. Um, this here, e3k.exe, this is uh, a binary for, uh, that's the unicorn bug binary. I don't know if anyone had heard of that one, but it came out like last year or no, earlier this year, I think, um, IBM researchers found it. It was a bug in uh, OLE auth32.dll. This is a DLL that's loaded by everything. And by the way, it's not just loaded by a lot of things. It is also loaded by a lot of things going back to Windows 95. So I've heard people say, oh, if you want to be safe from malware, you would just run Windows 95. Oh, no. This particular binary can exploit uh, that DLL, the bug that's in that DLL going back to Windows 95, uh, which is very interesting. So that's why they called it the unicorn. It's something that can exploit a bug that's, that just is, hits all versions of Windows. Um, it would have been really cool if it got Windows 351 or something like that, but <laughs> you can only hope. Uh, okay, so the other samples that I'm running through here, uh, let's play so it's going through each one of these uh, each one of these particular um, uh, exp uh, sorry each one of these particular binaries um, and these that are running right now are the CVE 2015 2015.0311. so this is a uh, this is a Trojan that was a, a flash exploit um, from about a month and a half ago this was the flash exploit that was the O day that just appeared out of nowhere, and then you know Adobe took a little bit of time uh, getting the getting the fix out there. But there were binaries out there exploiting it in the wild. Uh, so this was this is that particular one. Uh, and as you can see, um, we've got the AV scanner results here. So each one of the scanners, uh, you've got Clam AV, and this is the Clam AV result. Uh, ESET result. Uh, Clam AV is just saying that it's a general. Uh, exploit agent, it can't really tell you what it is. Uh, we've got ESET here, and it's giving you the actual CVE for it, and then uh, Trend Micro finds nothing. Uh, these are just three demo scanners for it. Uh, I have a, 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 a lot more, so at the moment I've instrumented uh, Bitdefender, ESET, uh, Avast, uh, Windows Defender, um, Clam AV, Komodo, and that's it. So uh, there's more more on their way. Anyone who wants to join the project and help uh, instrument AV scanners, please uh, talk to me after this. Um, I definitely need your help. Uh, it's a monumental task. I would like to have this at par with uh, with some of the main uh, commercial and online scanners. So let me scoot this back over here and. So I wanted to just give a shameless plug for my employer. They are awesome. I started there in uh, uh, November, so I'm one of their new newer employees. Uh, Threat Connect it provides a, a advanced collaborative threat intelligence platform, um, and it has a free version, right? So a free level. So it's not uh, you know it's it's not uh, there's no paid. Uh, there are many levels of paid accounts, but all of you can sign up for a free account in there, and you can see the indicators of compromise that I share with the common community. Um, you can also share your indicators. Uh, there's a lot of new, you know, new malware that shows up that we uh, that we put uh, data for in the platform. Um, and please sign up for an account. And if you want to uh, talk about this, uh, come come find me after my talk. Um, looks like I, he said I had five minutes. So uh, I'm cool. All right. So, any questions? Oh, uh, sorry, I, I, I meant to say, so 
the, uh, so my, my, my handle is Utkonos, and uh, Utkonos is Russian for duckbill platypus. So leaving you with a, a baby duckbill platypus. Yes? That's a very good question. Uh, I don't. Uh, so, one of the so uh, I think doing mobile uh, mobile malware scanners would uh, be a little bit redundant, except for a few. So there are a few AV scanners that are mobile that are mobile uh, targeted. They're specific to mobile and don't have a uh, version that's uh, uh, Windows or Linux or anything like that. So uh, I would like to. However, that would require, uh, you know, putting up a, you know, Android, for Android at least, uh, the Android SDK and running it, you know, you can run Android SDK and have like a little VM and you can run your, uh, that's actually how I run my mobile malware in the, in the. Uh, so it's like using the Jenny notion, which is actually Android on top of the toolbox. Oh. So if you're already doing the toolbox stuff, you can, it's just click, click, install Galaxy and Live and Google Awesome. I will, after the talk, I'll come get that info from you. Um, yes, so I do, uh, I do want to do mobile, but right now, I mean, the, I, I'm, I, I've already got like a lot of upscope, <laughs> so I'm trying to, to just uh, get, get, the, get the core of it done, and then I can start working on upscope, but uh, very good point, I'll, you know, I'll make sure, if you want to come talk to me, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll you know, let you know when it's ready. <laughs> Any other questions? So. So that's another good point, and no, I have not begun trying to, and you're talking in the Windows world, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I have not begun trying to shoehorn uh, multiple AV scanner engines onto the same box. Um, I would love to, and you know, if you have any ideas, please let me know. Um, but uh, so I, I had focused first on the Linux area, and Docker just seems like you know easy, the easy button for doing that. Any other questions? I would love to have Docker for Windows, but it just it it's based on a, a Linux only component. So yes. Uh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, Windows is not my favorite thing, but Docker and the concept of Docker makes things better, makes everything better. Um, any other questions? All right, so I have some swag. Woo! So lanyard, who wants a lanyard? Lanyard. Another lanyard. Uh, and then this is the, so since I'm so far from home, I brought you a Delaware B-Side shirt. So who wants a Delaware B-Side shirt? You should say the size on it. It's a large, I think. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and a Threat Connect shirt with, with nope. that. All the way in the back. <laughs> no, 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 no interceptions allowed. Because <laughs> I do have another one. The smaller one, I'll take it. This, no, I think they're both the same size. Got another one? You want it over here? Anyone over here want it? All right, all the way there. Orange. <laughs> all right. Actually, wait, wait, wait. How, you get this one. You don't know me. <laughs> Pass that one back there. All right. Thanks, everybody.